Okay, good morning everybody. Um, I'm Morellian, uh, security and protocol dev at Optimism. Uh, and this morning I'm happy to introduce you to, oh, hang on, we have Franklin and Olivier from Consensus who will be speaking to you about proving EVM bytecode execution in the ZK EVM. Okay, take it away guys. Hello, hello everybody, thank you for coming. Um, so, yeah, we are both from the Z sorry from Consensus R and D. We've been working on a zk AVM pretty much for about a year, and in this talk, we want to talk to you about um, its arithmetization, how we implemented it, and we'll have an announcement at the end. All right. Uh, so, first of all, why zk rollups? Um, the screen is not working for me. Um, well, in terms of scaling Ethereum, one of the bottlenecks that is addressed by a ZK rollup is that of the state. So in order to validate a state transition, which is um, you need to basically execute uh, the transactions within a block. And the state is a big object, and this uh, validation is a resource-intensive operation. So the promise of a ZK rollup is to basically alleviate that workload from most of the nodes in the network. So um, when you have a ZK rollup, you have basically this powerful node, which is an operator, which provides proofs of state transitions. And uh, these proofs typically ver verify the following, the validity of the transactions in the batch, uh, the fact that the internal logic of the rollup is respected, rollups are usually application specific, and the fact that they induce uh, the proposed state transition. And here and throughout, when we talk about proof, we talk about proofs of computational integrity, which in practice are implemented as zero-knowledge proofs. So a ZK EVM is a particular kind of a ZK rollup. Um, the big distinction or the, the thing that makes it a ZK EVM is the logic part. The logic that is being executed or, and proven in the proof is the execution of the Ethereum virtual machine. It also means that the transactions uh, that roll in pretty much obey the same format as standard L1 inst uh, instruct, um, transactions, sorry. Okay, so um, how does that work in concrete or semi-concrete terms? Well, you have your L2, which has a state, and um, a bunch of transactions roll in, and they induce a, or uh, executing them, induces a tran transition of state. And the ZKVM basically plugs itself at this point. It extracts the required data from the previous state. It takes into account the transactions and basically the diff uh, of the new state. And it does its magic and it produces uh, traces which it passes on to a prover. And the prover then produces a proof which ends up on mainnet. And in this way, you bundle uh, all of these L2 transactions into a single L1 transaction. <clears throat> so. Um, why would one want to build a ZK EVM? There's two parts in this. There's the ZK and the EVM part. So the EVM part, um, basically the advantages or the interesting parts is that it allows you to reuse or to use all the existing tooling which has been developed for L1. You can basically write in a ZK EVM, write and deploy smart contracts on, the sec on L2 just as though you were doing it on the L1. Furthermore, you can redeploy already deployed bytecode onto L2. And the ZK part in the ZK VM, well, it gives you um, the, basically the scalability boost and also finality, uh, faster finality, just because of the fact that there's a proof associated to it. So that makes it interesting as well. Okay, when we set out on this project, uh, we had a few goals. So we wanted to be able to, in our ZKVM, prove the execution of unadulterated native bytecode and respect the logic which is specified in the Ethereum yellow paper. We wanted uh, full coverage of all the opcodes. Uh, where we allowed ourselves to deviate is in terms of the representation of the state. And so, for instance, we will not be using Ketchuk. We are building a type 2 ZKVM in the sense of the classification put forward by Vitalik. So this project, um, um, I'm sure you're aware, presents a lot of challenges. Um, there's a lot of complexity that comes from the EVM itself, uh, which is composed of many parts which are tightly coupled and uh, have complex interactions. 
there's a lot of intricacies that are really specificities of the EVM. Uh, you have um, families of opcodes that have slight um, variations in their execution, uh, it's slight un non uniformity. There's a completely different kind of challenge, which is that of, of auditability. So, Franklin will touch upon that um, in his portion of the talk. And uh, the main challenge which, challenge which everybody faces today is that of performance, uh, efficient proving schemes. Um, yes, and this is something we will communicate on uh, at a further point. Today is really about the arithmetization. Okay, so here's basic, the basic setup um, of how it's going to work. Um, you will have a modified Ethereum node, an execution client, which receives transactions uh, sent by users or by dApps. Uh, we plug ourselves into this execution client and extract some data, which um, we use to fill some traces. I'll be talking more about traces later. And these preliminary traces are fed into this tool which we call Corset, which does many things. Uh, among them, it is responsible for producing the constraint system. Um, and it also expands and computes the remaining parts of the trace. All of this, constraints and expanded traces, are then fed into our inner proof system. Um, the inner proof system we use is not compatible with Ethereum per se, so we have to feed it into a verifier, which is a, a circuit over BN254. This is where we fl plug into with GNARK. And GNARK then produces the outer proof, which is then posted on mainnet. Okay, let's talk about a bit about the arithmetization. So first of all, um, on Monday we published an updated and um, expanded version of the spec, which is now a pretty hefty document. Um, and its contents are basically the arithmetization whoops, of uh, the EVM. So when we talk about arithmetization, in this talk at least, we mean to basically construct or write down a system of polynomial equations, uh, the simultaneous satisfaction of which perfectly encapsulates or captures a particular co computation performed on particular set of inputs. For us, the computations of interest are valid executions of the Ethereum virtual machine, given a set of transactions and an initial state. Okay, so since the EVM is a beast of complexity, it's a big thing, uh, we basically need, or it's it pays off to try to decouple as many of these um, components as we can to work in a modular fashion to sort of um, concentrate the complexity in different places. So this is the general architecture we have. We have the central piece, which we call the hub, which is basically our stack and our call stack. And then we have plenty of smaller modules that are tasked with doing specific kinds of operation, such as arithmetic or binary operations or storage. And uh, I I don't know if you can see it, but uh, uh, there's also the memory part. Okay, it doesn't work. The memory, which is this MMU and MMIO modules. Okay, and when you run uh, the ZKVM, what do you get? Uh, you get these traces that I was telling you about, which are these large matrices which contain data represented as field elements. There's one such trace per module, and each trace obeys its uh, own internal constraint system. So on the previous slide, uh, you had these arrows which pointed from one module to another, and this is basically uh, co connections, uh, pedal cup connections, which allow us to transport data from one place to another. The other kinds of constraints are basically the internal constraints. So for instance, when you update the program counter, you expect something particular to happen. But you also have another kind of constraint, which is uh, sort of global constraints, global consistency constraints, which range over the entirety of the block rather than two or three consecutive rows. And that, for instance, may express properties such as that, well, when you re-enter an execution context and you load something from RAM, you get what you last put there. So let's zoom in a bit on this central piece, the hub, which is, our, as I said, our stack and our call stack. It gets its instruction from the ROM. And what it does when it's ha once it has an instruction is to basically dispatch this instruction wherever it makes sense. Once it has an instruction that it loads from ROM, it first does some preliminary decomposition of that instruction. It extracts some parameters which are hard-coded, and it decides on certain things such as how to interact with the stack, how much data to excavate from the stack, and where to put it in the, in the trace, the layout basically of the data. It also raises uh, some module flags, etc. And uh, the next step is then uh, to dispatch the instruction, but before we can go there, we actually have to deal with potential exceptions. 
And the, the hub also deals with the exceptions. It's basically some of them it can detect, others it imports from other modules. And if an opcode makes it past this hurdle, uh, then you have the instruction dispatching per se, which um, kicks in, and you have these flags, these activation bits that light up, and you have some stamps that are updated because you need to keep track of temporality. Yeah, at this point, these activation flags, well, they tell you what will be active. So for instance, in, when you do a create, you will be touching RAM, so you'll be touching those two modules, uh, MMU and MMIO. You will also be touching ROM because you'll be deploying initialization code. And you will touch gas and memory expansion. And same thing for create2, but since there's a larger hash involved for the initialization code, you tap into some hash modules. OK, so let's talk a bit about the next big piece, which is RAM. So RAM is probably the most complex piece in our automatization. By the way, all the figures that I put here are available in the document. Um, and some of the, well, one reason why it is so complex is that it has all these um, data uh, stores which, with which it can interact. Um, and the different instructions uh, which interact with RAM actually have uh, different sources and targets. So the, there's already some first complexity. The next source of complexity comes from the fact that operations which are atomic from the point of view of the EVM, such as returns or creates, have to be broken down into smaller elementary operations in the ZK EVM. And so the first task is, task is to basically do a lot of ops, offset computation and deciding when some padding has to be done, this sort of stuff. And once all of this has been decided, well, you can start writing instructions. And this is still just writing them without executing anything. You just have this sort of workflow that tells you, in this case, I need to do this and that, uh, some exoram slide chunk or something. And once you're at this point, you are at the phase where you can actually start doing something. So this is the, the work of the MMIO, which is the, the actual RAM in a, in a sense. This is the, the component that touches data and that actually does um, the sort of byte decompositions, recombinations, slicing, dicing, surgeries, etc. And then you have these consistency checks that I told you earlier about, which is basically finishing the, the memory part. Uh, basically, what you've written last is what you should retrieve next time. So I'll stop here for the arithmetization. I'll hand it off to Franklin. So thank you for the, this very extensive description of what is a constraint system and the arithmetization. And now I'm going to talk to you about Please come back, thank you. I'm going to talk to you about how to go from this, uh, well, let's say conceptual data to how we actually implement the whole thing. There is a lot of challenges when we want to go from the specification to the implementation. And the f most, be, the biggest one is that there are three moving parts. On the one hand, we have the actual specification, 250 pages. Then we have the implementation of the specification. And then finally, we have the proof system of the verification of the, of the traces. So all of this stuff is developed by different people working on different teams. We still need to maintain 100% conformity between all of these pieces. So of course, if the prover is proving something else, that's what the spec is describing, which is it's itself something else that what is actually implemented, nothing will work. And finally, it's hard to audit three diverging code bases or three diverging sources of data. So what kind of solution did we find? We developed a formalized single source of truth, which is then exported to multiple targets. So what happened is that we have, in some format that I will show you in a, in a few seconds, a description of all of this constraint system. And from this single source of data, we are able to produce first a Go library defining the constraints on the data that will, be in the, that will then be used by the prover to, to actually prove stuff. Then we have another like, Go library that is used by the ZK EVM implementation to ensure conformity with the specification. And finally, we can generate LaTeX data for integration within the final specification document on the 215 pages of, uh, of PDF. So here is how it looks. So you can see that this is a very clearly uh, Lisp-inspired languages with a lot of parentheses or other kind of stuff. And this is a very simplified example of what you could find, for example, in all of the MMU. So what do we have in this? First, we have the columns definition. Those are like the columns of the matrices that Olivier showed you a few minutes ago. And you can see that they, are, they can either be normal, like the one at the top, or they can be, uh, we have a very rough typing system, type system that is used for some optimization. And finally, for the pure, uh, pure uh, ease of implementation and ease of use, we have some kind of very simple arrays, that kind of stuff, so yeah. 
Afterward, uh, you have helper functions, which are functions that can be well defined, like any other list function, to act, act on this data. And for instance, here you have two functions. The first one is checking that two arrays of length eight are actually element-wise equal one to the other. And the other one is computing the by, checking that uh, an array of eight uh, elements is actually a byte decomposition of a given value. So do, these do not really exist per se, but they are just like small uh, syntactic sugar for the ease of implementation. And finally, we have the, the, meat of the, the meat of the data, which is the constraints themselves. So here we have uh, an example of two, three constraints. So the first one is uh, doing a byte decomposition of some data. The other one is checking that memory is aligned, and so on, and so on. And from this, we will run it through courses that um, Olivier evoked a few minutes ago. And Corsair will do quite a few things. And among other, it will, for instance, generate a lot of Go code for the prover, that's because you can see here, and you can imagine how writing this by hand would be a living nightmare. Or we can also generate LaTeX. So here you have, for instance, a, a, piece, of, a piece of LaTeX code on the, the PDF rendering that is ready to be incorporated in the spec. So this whole stuff that we call Corsair is really uh, a cornerstone in our work, workflow on the, our implementation of the ZKV. Now I will talk to you about some results that we have reached for now uh, from the specification to the implementation to the actual results. So the first thing we want to benchmark our implementation against is the EVM test suite, of course. The EVM test suite is a golden standard for Ethereum clients, including but not, restric not restricted to the EVM itself. So we have tested our current implementation of the ZK EVM, which is, well, advanced but not yet finished. So for now, you see here the list of modules that are ready. So we have the hub, the MMU, the ROM, the LU, the binary, and some comparator functions. And uh, on uh, over 17,000 tests, we run our uh, <coughs> EVM on this, and uh, 16,000 are a success. So it means that it runs, and the traces are validated. Zero are failing, so it means that we do not have any problem handling this, uh, this, te this test. And finally, we have 1,303, which are uh, hitting functions that are not implemented in the, in the, EV in the ZK VM, namely, in this case, the pre compiled contract and the self-destruct operation. So for now, we have a 92.6% success rate on the EVM test suite, which is, we believe, a good start. Another way to test and to benchmark our implementation is, of course, to work on real data, right? So we have quite a few real-world examples, but the most striking one we have is, I believe, the successful execution validation of proof of exemptions using the Unisop contract and the successful execution and validation of random mainnet block. So what we do is that we run our Ethereum client on the mainnet and we generate traces for some blocks there and there, and then we validate all of the constraints. So I will show you a little bit how this works. We are going to check uh, the verifications of the constraint of the, on the traces we generated for this block 0x35b7e90 uh, blah blah blah. This block was uh, created uh, yesterday in the afternoon. So let us start and while it is working I will show you a little bit of what is in this block. So here is the data on letter scan of this block. Uh, as you can see, it is like a 20, 23 hours all. We have quite a lot of different uh, transactions in it. So we have a basic transfer transaction. We have uh, some uh, wrapped stuff. Uh, we have some multi-call. We have failing transaction. We have successful transaction. We have Uniswap. We have Tether. So it's quite a nice example. It's not a very big block. It has only 52 transactions, if I remember correctly. And it's only using uh, 2 million gas on the half. But it's, it is still quite... Uh, quite inclusive in what it, uh, what it provides. If we take a quick look at the traces that we generate for this block, so here you have a decomposition of all the data that we generate for this block. So on the very big red stuff at the top of the screen, you can see that in the end we generate, let's say, 13, uh, 13 and a half million of cells, so which is like the actual content of the traces. You can see that the biggest one are the binary with 2.5 million of cells. Then you have the ROM, uh, well, sorry, the ROM first with 5 million. Then the binary with 2 million and a half. The hub, which is also before the binary, sorry, with 3 million. <coughs> and all of that is culminating into 13 million of cells that have to be proved and checked and then cryptographically checked.
So here we can see that Corsair is actually doing a very naive check of all of this because it will basically just run all of the numeric, uh, numeric constraints that we define on all of the lines and rows of the matrix one by one, which is obviously very suboptimal, absolutely not cryptographic, but this is only a debugging tool that I uh, show you for to, to prove you that our stuff is still working. And as you can see, the validation is successful on the block 0x35BE is actually validated with all our constraints on our EVM. We'll be able to give all of this data to the prover and the prover will be able to generate the proof and put it on the main chain. Now, going back to the, to the presentation. So, sorry, I can't play because no Wi-Fi, so you will have the development version. So, in conclusion, the complexity of the EVM implementation has been partially solved with modules. Well, completely solved with modules. The intricacies of the EVM, maybe Olivier, you want to say something about this? Um, yeah, so in terms of um, basically finalizing the arithmetization, we have two big, two big chunks that are still left to be done. Um, but um, we are quite confident that it will be done um, basically for the testnet. Regarding the auditability, we, are, we, have, we don't have yet an audit or a formal verification of what we have done, but thanks to our single thought of truth mechanism, we have laid the groundwork to actually be able to work on that and prove in a single strike all of the, successes, uh, all of the, the three components with a, a single, uh, single audit. And finally, regarding performances, we are now connected to the prover system and uh, there will be more, uh, more information regarding that soon on the, in, a, in a coming paper. So thank you for your attention. We will be launching a testnet soon. So if you want to join, uh, please uh, just scan the stuff or just go to the, to the URL. And if you have any questions, then we will be happy to take them. Can you just give a high level overview of, of the differences between your implementation and the current other uh, ZK EVMs, such as uh, from Scroll and, and Polygon, et cetera? I don't know exactly the inner workings of Hermes and Scroll. Um, I know that we share some design principles with both. Um, I know that our prover will be different. Um, our automatization is also going to be very different. And um, I think this probably represents actually a strength overall, not for us in particular, but for the ZK EVM ecosystem as a whole keeping in line with this multi ZKVM prover future that Vitalik has been talking about. Um, but um, in terms of concrete details, um, I'm, I'm not quite aware. Well, regarding concrete details, uh, the big difference with Scroll is, uh, let's say, the arithmetization method. That they are, they are, well, the both of us are using different methods and we will see which one will sustain the test of time. On uh, regarding the difference with Polygon Hermes, the main difference is that uh, Polygon, contrary to us, doesn't directly work on EVM bytecode, but they first translate the EVM bytecode into another bytecode that is running not on the EVM, but on a, a, a ad hoc register machine, which is then proved. So there is a supplementary step that neither Skull nor we do, uh, do have. What are the opcodes that have been the most difficult to imp implement in the GK EVM? Um, you may be surprised, but uh, call data load has been horrible. Uh, you would expect if you, do, if you can do a M load, you can do a call data load. But in the way that we arithmetize things, it's actually quite difficult because of the provenance of the data and the fact that there's some padding involved. Um, but in terms of the real complexity, the real complexity is actually uh, for anything that involves um, uh, writing a whole lot of data um, with padding, potentially. So anything such as um, code copy, uh, Xcode copy, uh, um, I don't know. Um, yeah, basically these kinds of uh, opcodes have been the most complex. And if you look in the arithmetization about MMIO, there's literally pages upon pages of, um, I'm defining, we're defining nibble, nibble 7 and bit 8, and they have to interact in some complex way. Um, memory has been the, the worst.